uh, Jim and his book, Wittgenstein's Artillery, Philosophy as Poetry, a book that came out recently. It's one of actually two books that he wrote that came out recently, um, is our first presenter. Um, as many of you uh, know, Jim is a professor in the Department of Philosophy here at Virginia Tech. And without further ado, I'm going to turn to Jim. And please, Jim, we look forward to hearing from you. All yours. Thank you, Francois. And uh, I appreciate still being considered an Aspect author. It's been several years since I taught uh, in the Aspect program. I did twice co-teach uh, uh, in Aspect seminars, but uh, and my interests continue to uh, sometimes lie in that direction. And so of the two books that I recently published, the, the one I want to talk about today seemed the most relevant, the title being Wittgenstein's Artillery and then subtitled Philosophy as Poetry. And the juxtaposition of those two, uh, the title and the subtitle might seem kind of jarring. So I wanted to say a little bit about that. Uh, Wittgenstein actually functioned as a, uh, a, a, an artillery spotter during World War I. Um, it's kind of surprising that he fought in the war at all because uh, his father who had died uh, just a year previously uh, was enormously wealthy and left all the children uh, uh, basically millionaires, multi-millionaires, and um, Wittgenstein, in fact, had uh, had a hernia, uh, which would have gotten him out of uh, military service, so he wouldn't have had to serve in the military, probably, but uh, he volunteered, actually, which, uh, without revealing his uh, medical condition or his uh, wealth, and that got him uh, basically in at the bottom, uh, but he uh, wanted to, to fight. He, he volunteered. He saw it as a sort of trial by fire, um, and uh, being an artillery spotter is pretty a dangerous posting, and yet Wittgenstein won three medals for, uh, for bravery in the, in the course of his service. The, uh, the, the book itself, the, the, uh, the cover photograph uh, is of uh, some artillery spotters, not actually Wittgenstein. That, there's no picture of him uh, working in that way. But um, not only did he uh, 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 serve as a spotter, through several years of the war, but uh, he also used his wealth <laughs> to uh, 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 good effect. He donated actually about $2.8 million to have, uh, to buy a mortar, a, a, a 30.5 uh, CM uh, Skoda M16 mortar. Uh, and he, he, I think the timing of it was because this was the, had a prospect of having a more accurate, longer, uh, more easily uh, fired uh, piece of artillery. So he came to care very much about uh, not only his job, but how it could be done better. Um, uh, he, he wrote um, basically his Tractatus, his first uh, famous book, while he was in the trenches in World War I. And uh, we have notebooks that he kept uh, of his sort of day-to-day -day activities while he was working on the book and while he was he was fighting, and interestingly, he used military metaphors uh, in uh, about his own work. He said things like, "I'm laying siege to my problems right now," uh, and he said, "I worked all day, have desperately stormed the problem, but I will sooner leave my blood before this fortress than depart empty-handed." So he liked the, the the military metaphors, and so I've used Wittgenstein's wartime experience as a metaphor for, for his. Uh, his own imaginative at attempts to influence his students and his readers uh, and their take on philosophical issues. So uh, I refer to Wittgenstein's philosophical methods as his artillery. Uh, and so uh, as I use that metaphor in this way. And in fact, one of his students, uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, uh, referred to Wittgenstein's methods. Uh, he, she referred to it once as his heavy artillery and once as uh, his heavy, heavy machinery of demolition. So um, I, I think it's a, an, a, an apt metaphor that uh, connects his own experiences with his philosophical work. The subtitle though, Philosophy as Poetry then, um, Wittgenstein said uh, in, in his later thinking, in his later work, what he uh, said a number of things about what he was trying to get at, what he was trying to accomplish in his philosophical writing and lecturing. And he said things like, I don't try to make you believe something you don't believe, but to try to make you do something you won't do. 
And he said, uh, he talked about the difficulty of philosophy being a difficulty of a change of attitude. He said, resistances of the will must be overcome. And he talked about uh, his work sometimes as trying to bring about a, a as, as dealing with a, what he called a matter of temperament or prejudices of thought. Um, and uh, one passage that I talk about a few times in the book, he says, one must start out with error and convert it to truth. One must reveal the source of error, otherwise hearing the truth won't do any good. The truth cannot force its way in when something else is occupying its place. To convince someone of the truth is, it, it is not enough to state it, but rather we must find the path from error to truth. So that's interesting that he conceives his task like that because he hadn't always thought of his task that way. If you look back at the Tractatus, his early book, uh, it's really just a series of pronouncements. He sort of lays it out there and, you know, if you understand it, fine. If you don't, uh, fine. That wasn't his problem. But um, he, ca he came to think differently about this, though. Um, and in the first chapter of my book, um, uh, I talk about a, a transition in his thinking from what I call an, uh, an esoteric attitude to an evangelical attitude. And I think in the Tractatus, he has this very esoteric attitude of here, here's these ideas, but uh, you know, I don't really care if anyone understands me or believes me, or he, he doesn't engage the reader, you might say. And then he moves uh, uh, to a, a more, uh, I'm calling evangelical attitude where he's trying to engage the reader, trying to find what, it, what might prevent the reader from coming to see things the way he sees them. Um, in the second chapter of my book, I sort of pinpoint this transition in terms of the lectures that he gave to his students in Cambridge. There's a few sort of points at which you can see his concerns flipping, where he starts to see that it's important to engage his students and think about how to engage his students. And in the third chapter of the book, I pinpoint a spot in which you can detect this transition in his writing, in his writings for himself as he's working on uh, certain issues. He comes to see the importance and tries to find ways to address the reader that will engage the reader, find out what the, the problems are and so forth. And in fact, I sort of pinpoint this uh, transition to, well, I shouldn't say pinpoint, but I locate this transition to the spring of 1931. I think various things line up to make it fairly clear that that's when Wittgenstein's thinking starts to change about these sorts of things. He's looking for a new method of doing philosophy. And uh, around that time, he wrote in one of his notebooks, he said, one should really only do philosophy as poetry. And philosophers for the most part, or, or Wittgenstein scholars for the most part, have been very puzzled by that line, what he could possibly mean by that. Um, and so the rest of the book, I'm trying to sort of uh, work that out by uh, looking at what he's up to. Uh, what he wrote there was written in German, actually, and so the word uh, that he uses is not poetry, but Dichten, uh, writing poetry, something along those lines, and uh, philosophers have tried to figure out how best to translate the term. Dichtung in, in German has a much broader meaning than poetry does in English. It includes things like um, 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 you know, more literary writing. It includes fiction. Um, I think storytelling uh, probably fall under that category. And I've construed the notion of dichtung in this broader sense. And so even though I use the word poetry in English, it's important that I'm not really talking about rhyme and rhythm so much as the sort of more literary aspects uh, behind what Wittgenstein was trying to do. Well, in, uh, before this book, the last book I published was, uh, or the last major book was Wittgenstein in Exile in 2011. And for some reason that I can't uh, con completely reconstruct, Tom Gardner and I traded books. He had just post, uh, published a book, uh, John Among, uh, what is it, uh, In the Company of the Poets, and my book, Wittgenstein in Exile, and we traded books and read them and discussed them. And Tom started talking about how he thinks about poetry, how he teaches poetry. And he, in fact, shared with me some of the material that he uses in uh, working with his students. And it started to resonate with me that what Tom was trying to do was really what Wittgenstein wanted to be able to do. 
uh, Tom wrote things like, a poem does not just speak from a position of arrival, but it dramatizes the act of getting there so that a poem enables the reader to reenact that movement. And that really, I think, is what Wittgenstein was looking for. And so that helped me sort of try to think in a different way about what Wittgenstein was up to. And he, Wittgenstein often used this phrase, movements of thought, and he was interested in trying to see how we could change people's movements of thought. Um, and so uh, even though what I'm talking about uh, uh, isn't poetry per se, it's something very different from the pronouncements that Wittgenstein made in the Tractatus to uh, using something different. Uh, and he talks, he uses vignettes, he uh, speaks in aphorisms, he offers thought experiments, narratives, parables, uh, comparisons. And so I think all of these things are sort of what, what I'm grouping together under the, the English label of poetry. In general, he's trying to figure out how to address non-cognitive issues. I think that's maybe a one way to uh, sort of label what Wittgenstein was trying to do in his later thought is to try to affect how we think about things. He's it's often said it's a matter of the will and I'm calling these uh, sort of non-cognitive. Well, Wittgenstein himself occasionally did refer to his writings as his poems. And so I think that gives us, or gives me some permission to use that term in this broader sense. Um, but uh, if, you've, if you're familiar with the Philosophical Investigations, which is his uh, later book, um, it often reads as a kind of dialogue uh, between him and the reader. Uh, I think it has its source actually in the classroom I, and I tra trace that in the second chapter of how Wittgenstein um, interacted with his students, he tries to recreate that sort of interaction in, in the philosophical investigations. Sometimes the other person, this person he's speaking with is put in quotation marks, sometimes between dashes, or sometimes you just have to, you know, sort of get a sense of when the other person is speaking. But Wittgenstein often says things like, you might say, or people have often thought such and such. So it creates that kind of uh, sort of hypothetical dialogue. So then um, I consider 15 of what I might call Wittgenstein's poems uh, uh, specifically. And um, oftentimes they're just short kind of aphorisms or, or things like that. But what I do then is for each one of those, I try to find some poems in, uh, in others from other sources, uh, stories, narratives, parables, things that seem to be doing the same kind of thing that Wittgenstein was trying to do. So I'm, I'm trying to set him in a broader context. I'm trying to look at how what he was doing might be done by other people, sometimes better, but I'm not really making the point that uh, it could, this is better than that, but just that this is doing something similar to what Wittgenstein was trying to do, trying to influence how we think about something. Um, so in, in these commentaries, I uh, draw on a lot of different literary sources. So a lot of biblical parables, uh, the story of Job in the Old Testament, Plato's dialogues, uh, St. Augustine's convention, confessions, parables from uh, Kierkegaard, uh, stuff from Goethe, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Lewis Carroll. Uh, I draw on a couple, a couple things of science fiction from Stanislav Lem and uh, Ted Chiang, uh, and even children's literature, some from The Little Prince and uh, The Phantom Tollbooth. So I don't know if you all are familiar with some of these things, but basically I place Wittgenstein's poems in relationship to this kind of literature, uh, looking for a different way of doing what he was trying to do. Ultimately, Wittgenstein felt like he wasn't successful doing this sort of thing. He said uh, uh, in 1947, so around the time that he was done teaching, Wittgenstein said, quite different, <clears throat> excuse me, Wittgenstein said, quite, or wrote, quite different artillery is needed here from anything I'm in a position to muster. I think what he was saying was he didn't feel like he was very good at doing these kinds of things. And so the book is also my attempt to see, well, how might he have done better? Not claiming I'm better than Wittgenstein, but you know, how might we try and advance what Wittgenstein was trying to do, but felt um, like he hadn't done very well. So in the last chapter, one of the things I do is I uh, offer a reading of uh, 
uh, Plato's Phaedo as poetry in the sense of what Wittgenstein is trying to accomplish to, to see how another philosopher might have done that. And I also offer uh, two things of my own sort of along these lines. One, uh, one is a, a sort of dialogue about the meaning of life and the other is a, um, a kind of op-ed piece about climate change. Uh, I just wanna focus on one thing and I, well, I, I see I'm kind of running out of time. Well, I'll just tell you about it. Um, one thing that's important about in, to Wittgenstein is to emphasize the importance of context for understanding things. There's a danger, take the concept of understanding itself. There's a danger of supposing that understanding really is a kind of internal feeling, like uh, under, to understand something is to have this uh, aha feeling. But what Wittgenstein would emphasize is that the feeling itself really doesn't mean anything apart from the ability to actually you know, do show your understanding or, or manifest your understanding. That uh, uh, it's in what you, that, uh, understanding is an ability rather than a feeling. And so one way to make that point is that the context is very important to the concept. And um, anyway, I, I won't read through it, but there's a, a little chapter in the book, The Little Prince, and actually there's a few chapters in the book Little Prince in which the Little Prince goes from planet to planet and he encounters people. And oftentimes what's odd is that the person he encounters is acting as though something makes sense without the context that we're used to. He encounters a businessman, for example, who owns stars. The, the businessman can't do anything with the stars, but he owns them. And uh, the, the Little Prince sort of makes fun of the the fact that someone might be trying to uh, use a concept without the surrounding context that makes that gives it sense. So that's just one little example, and I've already gone past my limit. So there you go. Thanks.